good afternoon or good morning, everybody. We've made it to the last day. Great job. I think it's been a, a productive week. I know we have a lot of takeaways of things that we can go back and and tweak and improve. Um, and hopefully you guys have come away with um, a little bit better understanding of how to portray life safety risks. Um, so first off, we were going to just kind of go through some takeaways on the group presentations. Um, so some of our observations of things that went well. Um, overall, I think each presentation was really well put together. You could tell that all the groups collaborated really well and, and everybody participated um, and it wasn't necessarily just one person um, doing all the work. Um, so kudos to, to all the groups um, for working together. I know in this virtual format it's a little bit different, but um, it seemed like from our perspective it, it worked pretty well um, and you guys did a great job. Um, all of the, the summaries or all of the, the groups had, you know, good general summaries of the project information. Um, you brought good questions to the table and being able to respond to questions that you got from the instructors or the um, the LSOG, um, the pretend LSOG panel, um, being able to respond to those questions with confidence and um, you know acknowledging when you weren't sure or you didn't have um, the necessary information to answer the question, um, those are the kinds of things that you'll and a lot of you guys know this already from um, personal experience, but those are the things that you'll run into when you go to brief to, to DSOG or LSOG and you're you know, trying to communicate what the risks are to the decision makers. Um, and then we also had good questions and discussions um, from the groups who were acting in that role as LSOG and DSOG, so that was good to see. that. You know, you guys were equally contributing and um, kind of thinking critically about about the project. So, good job. Um, so, some things just to kind of you know take away and uh, maybe figure out how we can improve upon is um, incorporating the the big FN chart um, within the context of the, the risk characterization and the DSAC recommendation and what our um, determination is for TRG1. Um, a, a lot of times the focus is the big FN chart and this is specific to, to DAMS. Um, and in some cases that, um, that big FN plot is, is also part of the, the judgment um, and, and might need to inform the, um, the DSAC recommendation and, and TRG1, so just keep that in mind. Um, pulling in those complementary plots, like the risk profiles and the, the cumulative plots, um, that really helps us not only understand you know, what pools are driving the risk, but it also helps us convey to the decision makers what those um, critical pools are. Um, and that that's important because that um, oftentimes informs, you know, what the decision is, um, what pools we need to, to focus in on. Um, you guys jump in at any point if you want to add anything. Um, there were some instances where um, we had, you know, somewhat kind of key information that it maybe wasn't considered until, until it came up in the, the discussion. Um, one example was the stage frequency profile plots where you had that, you know, kind of blip in the, um, the frequency plots and just understanding, you know, what causes that. And, you know, for, for dams, it could be an inflection point in the um, hydrologic hazard curve and, and knowing in advance kind of what is causing that and anticipating that um, question from the decision makers 
um, is is always a good thing. Um, and then just, you know, kind of getting into that, um, the bias, what's it called? The bias, um, anchoring, anchoring bias. Anchoring bias. Yes. Um, when, you know, the, the, the group is presenting what their recommendation is, um, you know, thinking, kind of challenging that and asking questions that, or, you know, thinking outside the box of what, what the potential recommendation should be as a, a potential voting member. Um, so just briefly was going to give you guys kind of a, a comparison since we didn't have all of our groups on day three and day four together. Um, just as a point of reference um, for you guys to see kind of how the two experiences compared. Um, and again, there isn't, you know, there wasn't a right answer here. Um, we just kind of wanted to see that the groups were, you know, thinking critically about it and had good justifications. Um, but it was kind of interesting just to, to see the differences. So on day three, we had group A present um, Kirkland Levy, and they recommended an LSAC 4. Um, so I think, you guys help me remember, I think that was driven by where they were plotting um, in the portfolio. Um, and then they had TRG 1 was not met, um, TRG 2. Um, they had an EAP, but no specific public outreach was, was done. And then um, PRGs 3 and 4, were, they were recommending that those were met. And so the, um, the LSOC panel generally agreed with the TRGs. They were kind of split on the, the LSAC recommendations. We had one for LSAC 3 and one for LSAC 4. Um, the LSAC 4 was um, I think a lot of, dri of driven by the frequency of overtopping, the low frequency of overtopping, but the LSAC 3 was maybe more in line with the portfolio. Um, and then for day four, we had group D recommend LSAC 3, I think, for that reason, where it plotted relative to the portfolio. Um, but they actually recommended that TRG 1 was met. Um, and, and on that, before we move on to the rest of the discussion, we wanted to highlight Group D and call you guys out specifically for your enhanced understanding of TRG1 as it related to levies in an area that even we in the room had overlooked during the first presentation from Group A. So you all recognize that the societal threshold limit for levies is based on one of two things, the average annual life loss for non-breach and the sloping 1E minus 3 standard societal risk guidelines. So you caught on that TRG1 from a societal perspective was in fact met by Kirkland Levy where we completely overlooked it the first time around and Group A did as well. So kudos to Group D for seeing that, recognizing it and highlighting it during the presentation. That was great. Agreed. Um, so essentially the rest of the TRGs were similar. Group A on day three, TRG two was not met, I think because of the public outreach aspect. Um, for the LSOG, we had six vote for LSAC three and one vote for LSAC four. So then moving to South Bloomfield, um, so Group B recommended a DSAC-3, um, and I'm trying to remember what that was driven by. It's really the plotting position in relation yeah. to the dam portfolio. Versus the DSAC-2, though. Um, so it's it, it was right on the, it was just below the average DSAC-2 line. And I believe that Group E felt that the 
the risk was plotting very consistently with that DSEC2 line, whereas Group B thought that the uncertainty was justification to pull it down and recommend a lower DSEC? Okay. Um, so TRG1, they recommended that it was not met, um, but TRG2, I think they gave credit for, um, you know, they had plans to do public outreach, but it hadn't actually occurred yet. Um, and then TRG3, they said was not met. They had somewhat of a low DSPMT score um, of 72, I think, because they were, they didn't have an updated EAP or IRMP, um, which is interesting because the group E on day four um, was comfortable with that. DSPMT scores that they didn't feel like, and it is kind of in that zone of like, you know, it's not terrible, it's not great. Um, so it is somewhat of a judgment call, as are all of the, the TRGs. Um, but let's see. So the DSOC panel on on day three, um, they were split between DSEC two and DSEC three. So you had some people that maybe felt like it, you know, you could have gone with a higher DSAC. So there was some, some good critical thinking there going on there. Um, and a little bit split on TRG2 and TRG4. Um, I think, again, with TRG4, you know, they hadn't completed all of the IRMs, so some people felt like that, that wouldn't have been that. Um, and I think that was the consensus of the majority of the group on day four was that because they hadn't completed all of those IRMs that that, that TRG was not met. Um, but again, so the group group E on, on day four recommended DSAC two and that's the majority of, of the DSOG panel um, was in agreement with that. And then River Rock, so River Rock was presented on day four. Unfortunately we didn't have a um, a complement group to, to go along with them um, to compare, but um, this one was a little unusual in that, you know, the, the plotting position of the individual failure, mo failure modes when combined um, to get the total pushed it above the societal guidelines. Um, so there's that aspect there where you kind of have to look at both the little FN and the big FN plot. Um, but the group recommended a DSAC 3, and TRGs 1 through 3 were not met um, from the group's perspective. No public outreach. Um, they hadn't done dam safety training in the last five years. Um, and then the group, or the, the DSOG panel, generally agreed with those recommendations. Anything else from River Rock that we want to mention? You guys can think of? Okay. So, um, with that, does anybody have any questions or any feedback, things you guys want to discuss from the presentation portion of the, the workshop? Did you guys feel like it was a worthwhile exercise? Carmen, this is Amanda. I thought it was actually really good. Um, got a chance to kind of practice what it would be like in front of decision makers without having to have the extra stress of it being the decision makers. Um, I mean, you guys ask good questions, but you don't scare me. <laughs> so um, that was good. <laughs> Good. Adam it was, was trying still, to be I mean, really scary bad. all week. I know <laughs> well, you're just scary in general, but um, I, I've gotten over it. So, uh, but you guys, I, I thought it was really, really useful and really helpful to kind of take something we hadn't really known all that well and try to distill it down into something to present. Yeah, good. 
Well, and you guys did a great job of kind of, you know, tag teaming the presentation. Like some groups had maybe one person that did the briefing, but the rest of the group members generally chimed in and supported that person. Other groups, um, you know, split up the, the briefing. So it really, it, it, was, it was really effective either way. Um, but that's what we really want to see is that kind of contribution from everybody. Um, so that was that was really good. And you put everything together in a short amount of time, which is great. I mean, you guys didn't have a whole lot of time to synthesize all of this information that we gave to you in these long read-aheads, and you did a really effective job at pulling it out and putting it into a presentation effectively. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was uh, starting to talk earlier on mute. The double mute got me again, but I was going to basically echo both of the things that you all just said. So. I agree with Amanda. I think it was really helpful to go through the process um, as someone that doesn't have a ton of experience with like cadre lead responsibilities and pulling everything together. Um, it was kind of a very um, educational process for me realizing it's, it's, it's harder than I thought it would be um, to kind of distill all of that work down into an hour presentation. Um, but I also think it was kind of hard um, with the limited time that I think um, a little bit additional time on the front end, either more time to read through the material and or just planning for the class to take a little bit more time would help with putting all that stuff together because it was, um, you know, kind of hard to throw it all together pretty quickly. Yeah, um, I, I would say that would have been helpful because, like, I, I was the one that missed the, the blip on the stage frequency curve, and it was just a miss because I hadn't had enough time to review it properly to get out in front of it. Yeah, and that's totally understandable. I mean, you guys are, are coming in cold on these these projects. Um, so, I mean, overall, I think I think you guys did awesome. Um, you know, that it kind of is a good lead in. So the way you guys condensed everything down into the presentation was so effective that that's really what you want to translate over into your summaries um, in written form. And not just in this workshop, but, you know, in real life, you know, scenarios where we're having to condense, condense down what's driving the risk, what are the key components in the executive summary. Because the reality is, is that there's so many projects that the decision makers have to look at Really, all they see are presentations and our executive summaries. Um, so that's where we want to kind of hit on with what's most important. Um, and that's hard to do, you know, because a lot of the it's human nature is to feel like, well, I haven't, I haven't given them enough information, um, so I need to kind of put as much as I can into the summary. And then you kind of lose the important things in the you know, the mix of all of the the, the details that, that maybe aren't as critical. I felt like Group C did a an effective job with their boiling down of their failure modes. They, they basically just kind of went with the event tree and the call outs um, for the majority of their discussion, which at first when I noticed that's what they were doing, I was a little concerned that they weren't going to be able to provide enough information, but as we kind of asked questions and went things along, they, they had the information at hand, ready to go. Um, so I think they, they did a really good job of kind of taking what could be a couple of complicated failure modes and, and not not giving us death by PowerPoint, um, going note by note and explaining every particular thing. They really focused on what the, the critical components of, of that one were, so which I think, think was a really effective way to do it. Now. Nathan, I wasn't sure you were going to get through your H&H &H and consequence slides in an hour there for a while. Um, but uh. appreciate it. <laughs> I, I was actually shocked that every group yes. was right at an hour. Yep. Yeah. It was awesome. I'm like, wow. And Amanda's done a, a, enough uh, desogs um, by her PA role. I guarantee you that that almost never happens that everybody stays on schedule. 
So I, that's, that's definite kudos to each team. Like we gave you a short amount of time to put a presentation together and you all came in basically within 10 to 15 minutes of each other. So along those lines, Bart, this, this is Greg. Along those lines, I think, you know, what you said is good. You know, we, we need to try to distill this down the best we can to tell the story. I, I think what Carmen said is good also that, you know, a lot of times it's human nature and engineering nature to provide more detail than maybe they really need. But I think, you know, as far as CSOG and LSOG, I think, you know, it's good to, to highlight the, the main points, but then also have some slides that maybe aren't in the main deck, but that you can pull up if they do ask for that information, uh, you know, if, if they go down that path. So we've done that before in some, and, you know, sometimes we, we don't use them and sometimes we do. And so I think that's good advice. Yeah. yeah. And I think overall the teams were able to adapt to the questions quickly. I mean, we pointed out the one thing on the, the levy stage frequency profile, but for the most part, we asked some other questions that we knew were, um, were in the reports and everybody was really kind of prepared to be able to talk about those. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's, that's always been my important takeaway at SOG. When, when they ask you an important question and you sound like you have no idea, like what they're, what they're talking about or where they're getting at, or it just seemed lost. Like they seem to kind of write off the rest of your, uh, the rest of your presentation. And so I thought the teams in all cases in this one did a good job of being able to adapt on the fly, be ready to go. They were, you know, as as uh, Carmen said, the the ones that were a single presenter that their their teammates were there to like jump in and and help with that that part of it. And the ones that were presenters, like they either had the information at hand or they also had a teammate that was ready to help them out. So I thought that really really did go well. And, and sometimes, you know, when we're so involved in a project, um, we almost kind of lose sight of the things that are going to stand out to the decision makers. So that was kind of the point of that comment about, you know, the the blip in the the frequency curves is we we you know at the end we got to kind of zoom out and think about okay what what's going to stand out as kind of like looking weird or an anomaly. To the decision makers and what what questions might they have and just kind of have that in our back pocket um, you know is a good idea you know going into those those types of briefings but don't feel bad Zach both groups um, had the same question it was kind of a trick question I caught it eventually on our next slide yeah yeah, I know. Both groups, uh, you know, within a few minutes, they were able to to answer the question. It just took a second, which is yeah. It's not like you, yeah. Both both groups got to the answer without being told the answer. They uh, they just it just took them. They, it wasn't right at hand. Yeah. Well, I will say this, fine, this. Sorry, go ahead, Carmen. I was gonna say that's you know that happens and that's okay. Like you know it, it's. For humans, it takes us a second to to figure out a, a tough question. Um, so it's not the end of the world if that happens during an actual, you know, DSOG or LSOG briefing. No. What I was going to say is I I, I did I, I will say the class got me prepared for thinking because we've got a project coming up on a levy where it's actually got a very infrequent top of levy. So I'm already, already right. thinking of ways to kind of get out in front of it. Yeah, it's got like a one in a hundred thousand top of levy. So oh, wow. we're we're gonna have to spend a lot of time discussing why that is. Yeah. Well good. Um, anything else on the presentations you guys can think of? Mm -mm. Okay. So I'm gonna jump over to our summaries. So hopefully everybody got the um, feedback from the instructors. We kind of tag teamed all of the summaries. All right, so some observations of things that you guys did really well at. Um, just in general, the it looks you know it seemed like you guys put a lot of effort into 
generating the summaries. Um, so that was greatly appreciated by all the instructors um, on top of, you know, working together in your groups. Um, you know, what we, I think, came away with um, a takeaway that we need to do a better job of kind of explaining what the parameters are of, you know, how much time you guys need to allot for generating the summary, um, you know, what what the overall intent is. So those are some things that, that we're hoping to improve on with the next offering. But um, the ones that, that were able to kind of use plain English and translate the key components in a way that, that most people can understand, not just engineers, that's those really stand out, um, you know, and, and that's really kind of what what you're looking for in that executive summary. Because um, sometimes our decision makers aren't as in tune with the technical aspects um, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, you know, it's easy to take that for granted and, and just assume that they speak that same language. So um, that's that's definitely awesome when you can kind of translate it into a way that everybody can understand. Um, so for the performance piece, um, some of the things that stood out as, you know, good um, ways to, to capture each of the components is providing concise summary of the key points that, that drove the risk estimates. Um, you know, summarizing those pool intervals that, that drive the risk, um, that's, that's the key, you know, component that, that should be included in, in those um, discussions. And um, highlighting, you know, which failure mechanism or mechanisms drove the APF. And then, you know, just having a, a concise summary of the CFM description. So not necessarily going through the full failure progression, but in general, you know, describing um, the PFM and, and what what the key nodes are. Um, for consequences, you know, having that concise summary of the key essential elements that drove the life loss, um, so proximity of the PAR, um, characterization of the impact areas, your your warning times and flood depths and flood wave flood wave arrival times and your mobilization and evacuation routes, you know, having some aspect of each of those captured um, is, is important. Um, and then focusing on, again, on the pull intervals and the PFMs that, that drove the risk from a, um, a consequence perspective. Um, for uncertainty, um, you know, clearly identifying the main sources of uncertainty for the performance and consequences. Um, and so this is where, you know, that would be your, your meet expectations. Um, and then describing, in addition to that, describing the significance of the, of the uncertainty within the context of the, the levy safety or dam safety decision. You know, basically, what, why does it matter? So what? Answering that question of, of so what? Um, that kind of pushes it into that exceeds expectations category. Um, and then for your LSAC and DSAC recommendations, you know, making sure that, that it's consistent with the portfolios um, and, you know, adding in that, that justification um, when it may not be consistent, but here's the reason why. Um, and then just considering the, the FN plotting position relative to the societal risk guidelines. So all of you guys touched on, you know, some aspect of what we just went through. Um, so collectively, I think as a group, you know, we, we hit all these marks. Um, it's just, you know, some might have need a little bit more in other areas, um, you know, from an individual perspective. So for things that can be improved, um, just, you know, removing that template text, which again, you know, that's something we can communicate ahead of time, but um, really we want this to be the summary that you would hand over to a decision maker for them to read um, to help inform them on what the decision should be. Um, just checking those inconsistencies in the risk summary tables 
um, kind of boiling down again, we talked about this already, but you know, focusing on the, the critical components that that you know you want to touch on during that briefing, well that you know that needs to translate over into your summary. Um, we don't necessarily want to to copy and paste um, a bunch of text over from the report. Um, we want to boil that down into what we want the reader to take away as the most important um, factors, um, and you know, write it in a way that that anyone can understand. Um, and then just uh, considering the the big FM plotting position and recommending and justifying the DSAC um, when it matters. You know, in some cases they're they're both kind of saying the same things, but there are those cases where um, the two together kind of convey a certain um, conclusion, um, such as the, the River Rock example. Um, so that was it on the summaries. Did you guys have any questions? Um, like I said earlier in the workshop, you know, the rest of today is um, designated for time for you guys to, to make those tweaks that, that we noted in the, um, the feedback. And then, you know, resubmit, you can just resubmit that to myself, Adam, and Bart, and um, we'll take a, another look at those, let you know if there's anything else, you know, from there. But hopefully everybody understands what we were recommending or, or suggesting and can incorporate that. Hey, this is Eli. I have a um I have a question uh and this is probably more for more for my general knowledge. Um the uh the project we had uh that was the the Bloomfield Dam so like the, the non-breach um, risks were, uh, they, seem, they seem pretty high, or the, the, the life loss consequences. Uh, and when we were talking about, you know, the our DSAC rating, obviously you're not supposed to consider uh, non-breach consequences, it's all about incremental. Um, are there any scenarios where, or, or I guess really what is, um, what's the appropriate path forward on like, you know, approaching projects that, that have, um, in this case, it seemed like, you know, really high um, non-breach consequences with, with flood events that are, um, you know, with, with higher frequencies. Um, it just seemed, it seemed like there was a lot of non-breach risk there, um, and maybe that's something that's supposed to be captured in more of the tolerable risk guidelines. So, um, Yeah, so that's where that risk communication piece is so critical, um, you know, that it's not just about what the incremental risk is. We need to be communicating to the public what what the non-breach risk is associated with the structure, you know, that if it performs as it's designed, this is the risk that the inherent risk we live with. Um, and so that does come into play in your TRGs and making sure that that's, you know, adequately captured. Um, but you're right. There, there isn't a consideration there on the the DSAC from a non-breach perspective. Does that help answer that? Yep. Yep. Thank you. You. I think the understanding that we need to remember is that from a from a DSAC perspective, we're looking at kind of prioritizing the inventory for things that we can spend money on to to reduce risk or things that we need to study further and everything else. And in some senses, non-breach gets lost a little bit in that because, you know, they're, it's it's just kind of inherent to the, the, prop, the project. You know, we're basically making the decision that we're, that as we're making the decision for society that they're 
willing to live with, with the non-breach risk to receive the benefits from the dam or levy. So I think it's a component that we definitely consider, but it doesn't get captured in the in kind of the in inventory prioritization side as much. Not to take too much more time on this, it's it's really interesting to me, and I was in that group too with Eli. Um, are there times where I mean, Greg Warnke had a great suggestion. You know, can operations be studied and looked at to reduce non-breach consequences? And is that the kind of study that you know, non-breach risk, would there ever be a case where, hey, maybe you want to prioritize getting that kind of study done and work done um, for non-breach risk because it's significant life loss? I think that's really one of the reasons that the, the whole TRG component got added in to our um, setup is to give more credit to some of the other components of projects that were not you know, that we weren't weighing as heavily with some of our other decisions. Um, and, you know, there, there are many cases where non-breach becomes a, a, a big factor. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the California projects, when we start looking at spillway modifications and everything else, they look, they'll look really heavily at the modification of the spillway, like significantly increased non-breach risk. And is that really what we're, what we're trying to capture here? With our with our recommended alternative, so it, it's not that it gets ignored, and I think that's the point of that was one of the major components of putting the TRGs in there is to kind of gain a better understanding of some of those things from a are we are we being effective dam owners? But we also need to be careful too when we ask ourselves what considerations there could be to reduce non-breach risk. We have to consider the implications of it. So if reducing non-breach risk means providing additional warning to get people out of the floodplain, then that may very well be something that we could and should look into doing. It might be something that would be beneficial. When we start to talk about changing operations to reduce flows downstream, we need to consider the, the performance side of things and ask ourselves if we're increasing the incremental risk increasing the performance risk at the project by changing those operations. So let's say that we reduce non-breach flows. Well, then we're holding back more water. The reservoir is getting higher than it would be normally. What does that do to our performance risk? How does that affect our breach risk and our, our eventual incremental risk? So those are considerations we need to take into account as well. Any other questions? This is kind of our open question and answer period um, for anything that may have come up during the throughout the duration of the week or I've got something that's not really a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is Amanda. Um, you mentioned that uh, there was something different with levies for TRG1 that we didn't catch the first day, and I'm not a levy expert, so I was wondering if you guys could walk through that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The TRG1 slide. Yes. When looking at Kirkfield, Kirk, Kirkland, Kirkland, <laughs> Kirk, Kirkfield and Bloomland, yeah. when looking at Kirkland, the first group and what we honestly did as well, we looked at the societal risk and compared it to the 10 to the minus three societal risk threshold, which up until very recently for both dams and levees was standard operating procedure. But recent changes in how we're characterizing levy risk called into <coughs> consideration um, the first part of the yes bullet under the societal risks are, are risk tolerable from a societal perspective. So for levies, the societal risk threshold can change based on what the non-breach average annual life loss for the project is. So essentially, the dominating threshold or the, 
the critical threshold for societal risk will now be either the sloping 1E minus 3 line or the non-breach average annual life loss divided by 10. And the, uh, the dominating line will be the, how is it worded? It is the less stringent yeah. of the two. So essentially, whichever, whichever line ends up being higher. So when we look at Kirkland, the societal risk plotted just over one order of magnitude less than the non-breach average annual life loss. Since that was the case, the societal risk threshold for Kirkland was actually met. So I think that requirement out of the risk informed design <clears throat> ECB. So we've been using that a lot uh, for the last couple of years doing risk informed design on levies. And so the risk prior okay. to overtopping. Oh, I have the email. Should be in order of magnitude less than non breach. Okay. So that, because we were talking about in our group, like when are every most levies ever going to meet tall uh, societal risk guidelines? And it sounds like this is leaning that way so that we can actually have some levies that are tolerable from a societal perspective. Yeah, yeah. It, okay. the, other, the other place to look to is when you're doing your calculations for this, uh, the spreadsheet's set up to generate new diagonal lines based on that non-breach. So it's easier for you to see, you know, in, in the spreadsheet that you're, do, you're using to put together um, the background information that leads to you plotting, plotting these in the presentation. Yeah. And so that's going to lead to a lot of interesting conversations when we get to LSOC because when you look at our means of prioritizing and classifying levies and providing LSAC classifications, it's going to be really hard to continue following a one-size-fits-all where we compare everything to a single threshold line. Right, because average annual life loss for non-breach is going to change from project to project. So how do you how yeah. do you consistently prioritize a portfolio when the guidelines are all different? Mm -hmm. Something else important to consider for TRG one for levies too is that there's also a consideration under individual risk, where the the one e minus four line may not be the the dominating line anymore. For individual risk, you're going to look at the frequency of overtopping. And if the individual risk or the APF for the levy is less than one order of magnitude below the overtopping frequency, then it will also be tolerable, even if it plots above 1e e to the minus 4. Does that make sense to everybody? Sense. Thank you. So to, so to Jason's point previously, like the only opportunity that I've seen in the past where we've been able to meet TRG1 for a levy was that final bullet there of exceptional circumstances. Essentially, it would be on a project where they've gone through and done a feasibility study and determined there was no cost-effective way of reducing the risk to make it tolerable. So now there's at least some some more consideration to to account for that non-breach risk in there. So now we'll we'll, prob we'll we'll see some more that are tolerable now. So can Good we question. talk through a quick can we talk through a quick example of that using some numbers? So if we have an annual exceedance probability of overtopping for a levy that's one in a hundred, we're going to divide that by ten. So I guess initially I thought we were going to make it an order of magnitude less, but if we divide it by 10, are we making it an order of magnitude more? Because like one in a hundred for a levy is pretty common. So I guess so I'm if, still trying to figure out how the math works. If the overtopping frequency is one in a hundred, one in minus two, then we would divide that by 10. So the, the individual threshold limit would then be, 1e e minus 2 divided by 10, so it would be 1e e minus 3. Okay, so that's what I thought. That's, so we want to be an order of magnitude plus, plus less. 37. Yeah, so even though the 
the dashed red line is at 1e minus 4, because that's our standard annual probability of failure guideline. We don't want to hold a levy to, we don't want to spend too much money. Um, essentially, that's what this is all coming down to. We don't want to spend too much money trying to get a levy to an unrealistic level of, of risk that we perceive as tolerable from a dam's perspective when there exists non-breach risk and overtopping risk in the, the levied area that is going to be there regardless. So we don't want to spend too much money trying to reduce the risk to a level that's too far below the non-breach or the overtopping frequency. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks for putting numbers to it. I think that helped clarify. Yeah. Any other questions? This is good discussion because chances are if you have if you're unclear on something, then several other people are as well. So all good questions. I have a more um, like project specific question that I was gonna pick your brain on. Um, so I can either ask it another day or I thought maybe it would be a helpful question to ask right now. Um, it's a Bonzo yeah, question, definitely. fair warning. <laughs> what? I said, yeah, bring it. Okay, so, um, so Greg and I are working on Bonneville and I've talked with, I think some of you all a little bit on this project. Um, so we're not, we're still working through risk calculations. I think initially, um, so our life loss is gonna be relatively low. Um, initially, we, I think we were thinking the economic consequences were going to be pretty darn significant, like upwards of two to $3 billion. Um, the more we've kind of dug into those, I think it's going to be smaller than that. And it also sounds like the more we've talked about the like economic risk and reputational risk, um, you know, some of those marks are kind of, I guess, hard to meet and hard to quantify. Um, making things on a national scale versus a regional scale seems like it's pretty hard to um, do as well. And so I think where we're landing um, is something that I think got mentioned at one point during the week is that and this is a high level IES. Um, we're doing a QRA and um, there are definitely things that could be done at the project to reduce the risk, but when it comes down to actually voting for like a DSAC, I'm not sure exactly what we'll do, but I think at the highest, we would probably end up being a DSAC three, most likely a DSAC four. But like I said, we haven't finalized that discussion. Um, but are there scenarios where we could set, like, I guess, I think where the things have been trending towards was that we would recommend to go into a DSMS. Um, but a lot of the things that we would recommend are relatively small scale, um, fixes like adding um, generators or um, being more thorough about gate splitting and stuff like that. And so I guess it seems like it's a pretty unique case. And um, I've kind of had a hard time putting my finger on, I guess, how unique it is and if that's something that's ever been done before or can be done, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And it is, it's, um, it's tough because it's it's a judgment call and then you know in some cases you might have the perspective of the district that's a little bit different than the team actually doing the risk assessment and so that gets to be challenging but i mean in that scenario it sounds like if if the potential fixes are relatively small scale that it it might be more appropriate as like an O and M approach, um, you know. But it it gets to be a challenge because then if you go with a lower DSAC, it's harder for the district to get the funding that they need to do those, um, you know, fixes or address right. the item. So it it's somewhat of a a tight wire. Um, that you walk, but I think ultimately that's where we as the, the risk assessment team have to make our recommendation to the decision makers of what we think makes the most sense to us and why. 
and and then it's the decision makers, you know, who are ultimately kind of making that call. Um, right. And sometimes that might be, you know, consistent with what we recommended, and sometimes it might not be. Um, but that's the best we can do as the risk assessment team is to to just give them our logic and thought process on what makes the most sense to us. Yeah. I don't know if that, did that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. At least gives me a little bit uh, additional guidance. Yeah, and I think, you know, on Bonneville, I think they have pursued, you know, like a major rehab. I think they're over, a little bit over the threshold for that. Um, or a little bit under, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, they, they pursued that route and haven't had any luck. So yeah. anyway, they were kind of looking. So it's kind of getting, getting falling through the cracks. So I think that's good advice, Carmen. I think we just need to say, hey, here's the risk. I mean, there's some pretty low hanging fruit there that would buy down a lot of risk. You know, even if it plots a decent four, they should do it. Uh, right. <clears throat> but anyway, right. I think we need to make that case. Yeah. I just want to close the loop and make sure, is everybody following the discussion of the variable risk guidelines for levies? Would it be helpful to look at the toolbox like Jason was saying to see a visual? I know that helped me when we were talking about it and here this week. It's just talking through different oh, examples. I've got, I've got the actual one for... Of, you know, when... The one we just did. Do you want to walk through the, the F, big FN one we're talking about it too? I th yes, um, because that was another kind of. Do you want to do that before we get off of this? Revelation. Go the example. Yeah. So, before you go on to that couple of distinctions here in the toolbox. So what you're looking at are the results of the Kirkland Levy SQRA. When you open up the toolbox, you're going to see a drop down for showing reference lines and you're going to see report all traditional controlling or none. There's a lot of different options here. So report is just going to it's just going to show the traditional sloping 1e minus 3 line and the traditional low probability high consequence box. That reflects, you know, we're not showing our individual risk guideline, 1E minus 4. We're not showing that for our reports anymore. Um, and it just has the standard lines. And that's what we're going to be using in all our reports and our presentations. That's how we're going to be portraying things to decision makers um, until further guidance is, is released. We're going to stick with the standard. But then the next, you can select all. And that's going to put a hodgepodge bunch of lines on there. So you're going to see the traditional 1E minus 3 sloping societal risk line. You're going to see the traditional horizontal 1E minus 4 individual risk line. And then you're also going to see on the plot the solid sloping green line and the solid sloping blue line. The sol uh, solid sloping green line represents a linear representation of the non-breach average annual life loss. So we have our non-breach point plotted in green, and then all the line is is basically a straight diagonal line drawn across the chart representing that threshold across all of the, the average life loss values. The sloping blue line represents the overtopping frequency. So that's the AEP of top of levy, basically. And then the dashed green line and the dashed blue line represent basically the non-breach line divided by 10 and the frequency of top of levy divided by 10. And those are representing the, the secondary thresholds or the variable thresholds for that particular project. So then if you go down and change the selection, you can show traditional, which is just going to show those traditional black dashed lines, or you can go to controlling, 
This is going to show you the actual controlling guidelines for your specific project. So these will change depending on the project specific information that you enter. So in this case, the societal line is going to be governed by the non-breach divided by 10, and the individual line is still going to be governed by our traditional 1E e minus 4 individual risk threshold. Any questions on that? All right, perfect. Thanks, Bart. Go back and share the presentation again, Colin. So, <coughs> the template. Let me let me pull it up so I can use my mouse. Okay. Where is the template? Um. Got one somewhere. Uh -huh, but I can send one to you. I've got one. Here, here, I've got it. Why don't you just pull it up and you can use my mouse? I'm pulling one up. All right, we we spent some time doing this yesterday, so we wanted to call this out to you all today just to make sure everyone is following along. So we want to talk, and this one's outdated because it doesn't have a thumb on there. So let's. You got no. You're on QRA. Go to. You're on SQRA. Oh, I am on right. SQRA. You're right. Thank you. There it is. Yep. That's it. So we wanted to talk through, from a societal perspective, we see we have yes, no, maybe, and maybe, but there's some additional language in here that may or may not be familiar. So we have the traditional evaluation of our average annual life loss in terms of the little fn chart, but then we also have big F and big N from the big fn chart. So if you're not familiar with with that nomenclature, it's likely going to be a little bit confusing. So we'll walk through it. We'll start with this yes. So to be tolerable from a societal perspective for a QRA, your average annual life loss needs to be less than 10 to the minus 3. So that is saying that your average annual life loss will plot below the 10E e minus 3 line and also your big F will be less than 10 to the minus 3 divided by N. So when you look at the big FN chart, any point on this curve represents the probability that life loss greater than N will occur. So the life loss, the probability that life loss of greater than 1 will occur is roughly 1E to the minus 3. So when you split that up and you say, big F needs to be less than or, or less than 10 to the minus 3 divided by N. Essentially, all that's saying is at any point, your curve cannot cross the 10E minus 3 line. So that's what this big F is less than 10 to the minus 3 divided by N. That's what that represents. And then the additional qualifier down here for yes says that N needs to be less than 1,000. So that is saying that in addition to being below the 1E minus 3 line, you cannot be plotted within the low probability high consequence zone, both for your little FN and your big FN. You need to be on that side. So you need to be plotting in this area. Conversely, for no, it's essentially saying you can look at the specific language yourself and and figure out what it all means, but it's essentially saying that you're plotting in the area above the guideline. So you are very clearly not tolerable. 
The only thing that's different here is you're going to see big F is greater than 10 to the minus 6. So when you say, when you see that big F is greater than 10 to the minus 6, all that's referring to is, let me get rid of these annotations here. That is saying that your big F, so over here on the y-axis of the big FN chart, is greater than 10 to the minus 6. So that's really calling out this horizontal line right here. So your average annual life loss is greater than 10 to the minus 3, and your APF is greater than 10 to the minus 6, or your big F is greater than 10 e to the minus 3 divided by N, and big F is greater than 10 to the minus 6. So then you get into the maybe categories. And the first one says that your APF is less than 10 to the minus 6, or your big F is less than 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 6, and your N is greater than 1,000. What that is communicating is, let's take South Bloomfield, which plotted right about here, and the big FN curve looked kind of like that. Let's say that now it plots down here, and the big FN curve looks like that. That's what this first maybe is trying to capture. It's saying if your project falls squarely within the low probability, high consequence zone, then it may be tolerable. And that's when you have to consider a higher standard of care. You need to make sure that the evaluation of those potential failure modes is at a higher standard of care to ensure that the risks are properly characterized and everything is being done to ensure that we're reducing risks as low as reasonably practicable. And then the final maybe is very similar, but carries one additional caveat. It's essentially saying that you may be tolerable, and this is where River Rock Dam would come into play. So River Rock had one failure mode that plotted here, one failure mode that plotted here. And the total average annual life loss plotted above the guideline but the little fn plotted below the guideline. So this last maybe says, hey, there are some cases where your average annual life loss is greater than 10 to the minus 3, and that's what we saw for River Rock. And your APF is greater than 10 to the minus 6. So that signifies that you're not in the low probability, high consequence zone. You are plotting above the guideline. However, when you look at your big fn chart, your big F is less than 10 to the minus 3 divided by N, so you are less than the sloping guideline, and your big F is less than 10 to the minus 6, meaning that you can fall into the low probability, high consequence zone. So it's signifying that although you, pro you cross into this box down here, at no point does your big FN curve exceed the guideline. So that's meant to cover cases like River Rock or cases like we've seen historically Green Peter or Blakely Mountain where we have a total average annual life loss in little FN space that plots above the guideline, but the big FN plot does not. Any questions on those? Hopefully that was helpful. We spent a decent amount of time yesterday in the room going through the nomenclature, trying to make sure that everything makes sense. So I, I hope that was beneficial to go through that. All right, well, unless nobody has any more questions, you are, you can be released and Hey Bart, the only thing I was gonna I was gonna mention earlier to you, and this isn't a question, but it was something that worked well uh, for our our group was uh, we we created a, a team uh, a team on Microsoft Teams to collaborate and be all all be able to work on uh, the PowerPoint. I don't know what others used. Um, I think that worked well for us and internal, but I. I and I guess it is somewhat of a, a question to you all, but it is to think about what can be used whenever this course is opened up 
uh, to the public as far as a collaboration space between maybe internal f core folks and uh, public sector because I don't know if we have anything to collaborate anymore. To work on a document. That's a good point, Jason. We'll uh, we'll write that down. Yeah, and then other. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Carmen. I'll jump in when you're done. I was just going to say, you know, our, our focus has been internal. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's going to look a little bit different once we do go external. So I appreciate, we all appreciate that feedback of maybe ways we can improve things um, once we, we do go external. Was that Michaela? It's but Jamie. It was, it's Jamie. It's Jamie. Um, I was just going to say one thing, um, and it might have just been me because I've been I traveled the last three weeks, and it was in one of the smaller groups. But getting a heads up about, um, I I planned to kind of have time outside of the scheduled class time to be able to knock out other things that I've been postponing because of travel, um, and didn't really have the ability to do that with it, like prepping for presentation and working on the assignment. So I think going forward, basically letting attendees know to dedicate the full week time to the class um, in order for the presentation and for the assignment might be helpful to have a little bit more of a heads up. Yeah, I think we recognize that um, based on the submission times and 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 some of the other stuff that uh, that maybe that that we need to think back through some of that a little bit, um, whether that be a communication issue or or how we structure things uh, moving forward. Uh, but I think we 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 recognize that 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 is, and I think some of it could come from um, uh, we can we can make some time in some other ways too. I guess you know. <laughs> Some of the groups, I felt like they, you know, they felt like they had enough time for the presentation, um, but it was the summary that, that kind of they had to squeeze in. Is that the general consensus? Me, it is. This is Damien. Yep. Okay. I agree with that. And how much time just like average do you think we need to allot for the summary cuz it wasn't i mean we didn't want you guys to have to spend you know several hours putting the summary together but and really you know being able to do that i think with the the experience of putting the presentation together maybe would help streamline that. So maybe we make the submission of the summary, you know, after you guys do the, the group project. Yeah, I think that would go faster. But I was going to add one, one thing that um, I could offer from the site, site characterization thing that we just did in Chicago a few weeks ago was that, um, so you'll never get it right. Uh, the, the the experience level of the audience is going to be pretty pretty wide usually, and so we've never been able to actually get our <laughs> the presentations to match the audience uh, perfectly. So that's the most common complaint we get is that the it's either way too complicated or it's way too easy. And then there's a handful of people that are in the middle that thought it was good, but it's never like spot on. So what we right. try to do for that one is um, at the beginning of the class, like ask people what their experience level is, like what, what's, what's your expertise, what's your discipline? And then we've kind of tried to tailor our different exercises to have like, you know, high, medium, low levels of uh, difficulty and then assign people where we think they fit. And that never works either, but it's, it's our attempt to try and get, the, you know, difficulty match with experience. Uh, so for my example, uh, I, I suck at like all the, the math, right? I'm a geologist, so I can do like addition and subtraction mostly. 
Um, but, you know, I'm better at doing like uh, stereo nets like Adam showed on the, on the first day. So like matching me with some a project that has that right balance would be, um, yeah. I don't know, better. Yeah. Or maybe we pre-populate the, the summary tables and the plots, you know, and and then the participant has to develop the text. Yeah, I was going to say I, I thought yeah. it it was really good for me to be able to go through the homework process because it was very educational and it's something I don't do a lot of. But because I'm not familiar with building that case, it definitely took me, you know, I'd say closer to like three hours than it did 30 minutes. Um, but okay. I think it's one of those things that people that have experience doing it can probably bust through it pretty quickly and uh, to Damien's point. But for, for me, where I'm usually just focused on H and H, you know, I'm kind of, it's kind of a whole new world, right? Kind of thinking through some of that stuff. So I think it was a really good experience to do it, but, um, it definitely was more time consuming. Um, just trying to wrap my head around everything and you know, how to put it all together. Okay. And and that was um, maybe a miscommunication our, on our part, you know, where we had that half hour in the agenda to to finalize your summaries. Um, the, the the expectation wasn't that that you guys would knock it out in a half hour. It was just a, a placeholder of like, you know, submit it by the end of this day. But this is good feedback, you know, that we can incorporate that we might want to allow a little bit more time in the schedule to um, for people to work on their summaries. Yeah, and I'll just kind of how... I was going to say I'll kind of echo Jamie's comment too that um, I think the homework was good. I think doing the presentation was good. I think both of them really helped me with knowing and learning the process. And just having a little bit advanced warning, like it, it feels like some of the RMC trainings there is no homework, and then well, I guess really RMC and HCC all training, some don't have homework and some do, so it's just kind of hard to to know. So just letting people know in advance that hey, there's going to be some advanced reading materials to go over and some home, homework, and then people can kind of schedule that. I think would help out in the long run. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know to what degree not giving an example was intentional or not. Um, I know for some of the classes that I've helped with, <laughs> we've debated that. Um, so I, I thought it was good in that the homework made us think a little bit, but um, just echoing the time, like I ran out of time. I had to, it was an office day for me and I just had to get out of there. So you kind of just eventually just send in something. Um, which isn't ideal either because I think a lot of us are also balancing other emails and requests that are coming in. Um, but I know for me, depending on for external audiences, I guess maybe this is a comment more moving forward is that if a full example is not provided, having a little bit more guidance of like, we're anticipating a two page document or, uh, you know, something to that effect because it was, um, maybe just a little hard on my end to appreciate like what level of detail the team was wanting. Um, is it more of like an executive summary or, you know, obviously not a full chapter seven, but I think some a little bit more guidance in terms of the the length, I think can also help provide them be a, a, a surrogate for level of detail. Okay. That makes sense. Well, I appreciate your all's feedback and uh, participation and, and being the, the guinea pigs <laughs> um, and helping us work through through some of these things. So um, your contribution is, is going to help make it a better workshop as we go. Um, did you have anything else, Bart? No. All right. I know I'm, I'm the only thing standing in between you and lunch for some people. Um, so if there's nothing else, um, we'll let you guys go and just, um, if you can submit, you know, those tweaks to the summaries by the end of the day, 
and and then that will be your your course um, serve as your final exam. Um, but thank you again, everybody. This was enjoyable. Hope you guys got a lot out of it. <laughs>